This word has been on my heart for uh, a few weeks now since Pastor first asked me to preach. And uh, I had it framed, if you like, as I was thinking about it over the weeks. But this, this week's been particularly difficult. We had a break in at work on Monday night, and I was uh, up till about four o'clock in the morning trying to resolve that. We didn't have anything stolen, but uh, it was uh, waiting for people to board up, giving the police statements and things like that. And I'll tell you what, I came home, I was totally wired. <laughs> I couldn't sleep. You know, so I've been sort of recovering from that all week. As you get older, you, you, don't, you don't bounce back from uh, things, uh, lack of sleep as easily. So this has been quite a struggle to put together, but it's been really m very much on my heart. And I want to read, first of all, from um, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and verses 1 to 6. 2 Corinthians 10, 1 to 6. Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the weakness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence with which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your disobedience, when your obedience is fulfilled. Now Paul was dealing with a particular battle with the Corinthians. He was saying, some Corinthians were saying, he pens these mighty letters, but in person he's quite a feeble individual. And Paul goes on to say, I'll be dealing with that when I come again. And you'll see how feeble I am. That's not the subject of my word this morning. My text is taken from verse 5 and the second part, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And I've been really struck by that verse. About, and the, I'm titling this word the imperative of bringing our thoughts into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And at the very outset, I think it's important to stress that God's thoughts are not our thoughts, and his ways are not our ways. And we need to align ourselves with God's thoughts and God's ways. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours and my thoughts than your thoughts. Can anyone measure how high the heavens are above the earth? You know, as science and technology improves, we delve deeper and deeper into the universe and we see how marvelous and how large and vast the universe is, billions of light years across. And just on this aside, I was really blessed this last week. I saw a, a YouTube video because last year they launched the James Webb Telescope into space. And it's far more powerful than the Hubble Telescope that's been there for several years. And it's seeing further and further to the utmost limits of the universe. And if you accept the Big Bang theory and the expanding universe, then we're looking back in time. And the light that comes from those galaxies was from the very start of the universe from the very big bang and therefore in its infancy because it's taken billions of years to reach earth and guess what what they're seeing is those galaxies fully formed not in their infancy but mature with stars and just like galaxies closer to home and it's put into into disarray the whole idea of the big bang because it doesn't work they're seeing them in the maturity because it says in the hebrews by faith, we understand that the worlds are framed by the word of God. So the things seen, things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. That's where we stand as Christians. We have a mighty God who's able to suspend, well, not even suspend because he's outside of his creation, isn't he? The laws that he put into creation, they're easily changed by God because he created them. And I was really blessed by that. That's just an aside, but that, that really did bless me. 
You know, God is so much greater than his creation. I believe Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 was always a case, even before the fall. What is man the creature, even in his perfection, when compared to Almighty God, the Creator? However, the fall and the entrance of sin corrupted man's thoughts, and it put us diametrically opposed to God's thoughts. Satan's lie in the garden to Eve was, you'll not surely die. You'd be like God, or be like God's. And it was a lie. And it corrupted the whole of man's thinking right at that set up, at the, at the outset. So we see the evangelistic call in that verse in Isaiah 55 that precedes those verses we've just read, the great evangel call. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. And let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Here and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. Indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people and a leader and commander for the people. Surely you shall call a nation you do not know, and nations who do not know you, who do not know you shall run to you. It is the Lord, your God, and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. It's not just a question of deeds. It's a question of thoughts. Man's thoughts are corrupted by the fall, and every imagination and the unregenerate man's mind is evil. The thoughts of those outside of Christ separate them from God just as much as their sinful acts. And the two are inex often inexplicably, inextricably linked. Jeremiah 23, 16 to 17 tells us, their heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And it's out of our hearts that our thoughts uh, proceed. Contrast that with the worldly wisdom we hear today. Follow your heart. Follow your heart. That's what the world tells us. But the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful. And it will lead us to hell. Jesus, in arguing with the Pharisees about ceremonial washing, when they saw that his disciples didn't wash their hands before they ate, says in Matthew 15, verses 18 to 19, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with one washed hands doesn't defile a man. Prior to the flood in Genesis 6, verse 5, it tells us the Lord saw that the wickedness of man is great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Romans 1 tells us how mankind rejects the testimony of creation, but it so clearly points to its creator. It's as plain as a pike staff, he would see it. But verse 21 says, because although they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God, no, we're thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Man in his fallen state rejects God from his universe and proudly states, there's no God. Richard Dawkins says that God uh, wrote his book, The God Delusion. There's no God. It's a figment of man's imagination. Well, the Bible pronounces that man a fool. Psalm 14 says, The fool has said in his heart that there is no God. But even if unregenerate man acknowledges God, his approach is all wrong. 
And we want to draw your attention to the story of Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5. Naaman was a king commander of the Syrian army. The Syrian army was the greatest empire at that time. And he was a man of high status. If you like, he was the Eisenhower, the Montgomery, bring it more up to date, the storming Norman Schwarzkopf from the Gulf War of his day. He had great renown and great prowess in battle, great prestige. He was greatly beloved of his master, the king, because of his military prowess. And he's used to everybody kowtowing to him. But he comes to Elisha to be healed of his leprosy. And we pick up the story at verse 9. I can just read that. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. He, there he is standing at Elisha's door in all his finery, with all his entourage, with his horses and his chariots, and he's expecting Elisha to come out to see him. And Elisha doesn't even deign to come out and see him. He sends a servant. He says, go wash in Jordan. And you'll be clean. Seven times and you'll be clean. And that's like a dagger to Naaman's heart. He becomes furious. He says, indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me. Does he not know who I am? He wanted Elisha to put on a great spectacle. Acknowledging the greatness and status of the man standing before him. Then he comes up with his own solution. He says, we've got far better rivers back home in Damascus. But he wants me to wash in Jordan. It's no better than a ditch. We've got rivers that come down from the mountains with glorious water, fresh mountain streams. But he wants me to wash in a muddy old ditch. And I want you to see how ridiculous and foolish Naaman's response is. He's a leper. He has such a fearful disease, which is going to see him ostracized from society and ultimately lead to his premature death. And yet here he is calling the shots. That leprosy is symbolic of sin. And he's presented with the simplest of solutions. Go wash in the Jordan seven times. You'll be clean. But that offends him. What gets in the way is his pride, his preconceptions, and that he was far more deserving and wanted it his way. And that so often is a stumbling block to people coming to Christ, their thoughts. Thankfully, Naaman's servants are far wiser. They love their master, they prevail upon him, and he does as Elisha has bid, and he's gloriously healed. But the only approach is that of the tax collector in Luke 18. He wouldn't so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but he beat on his breast. And he said, Lord, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's all we can do when we come before Christ. Lord God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. Spurgeon preaching on this verse puts it so well. Quite a long passage, but it really blessed me when I read this. In thought is often the very essence of sin. A deed might in itself be colourless the motive for doing it, the thought at the back of it puts the venom and virus and guilt into the deed. As this is the case, what sort of thoughts must the unrighteous man give up? 
He must give up a great many fine opinions of which he's very proud. His opinion about God, for instance. Is it possible that he has, it is possible that he has thought nothing of him? Or if he has thought of him at all, he's dared even to judge his creator and to find fault with what God does. Ah, sir, you must give up all such thoughts of God and you must come to reverence him and to regard him as so great you were less than nothing in comparison to him. You will also have to give up your opinion concerning God's law. You thought it was too severe, too stringent, and that you could improve it a great deal. You'll have to confess with the Apostle Paul that the law is spiritual and that you are carnal, soul under sin. You will have to change your mind on a great many subjects if you really wish to be saved. You'll have to forsake your old thoughts concerning sin. You said, oh, it's a mere trifle, a peccadillo. Poor helpless creatures as we, God won't be angry with us for such a little thing as this. You will have to feel that sin is exceedingly sinful, a great and deadly evil, and you will never likely to seek and to find, or you will never be likely to seek and find peace with God. You'll also have to change your mind about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's nothing to you now, but he will have to be everything to you if you are to be saved by him. You'll have to change your mind about yourself. You fancy that you're a fine fellow now, but you'll have to regard yourself as less than nothing before you come to your right position before God. If ever you were to find mercy in his hands, you will have to forsake your present thoughts on all these matters. At the end of the book of Judges, we read, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Man was his own judge. And what an awful situation it was. And you couldn't really get a better commentary on the 21st century Western society than that. Man does what is right in his own eyes. Proverbs 14.12 tells us there's a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. Our thoughts outside of Christ will lead us to death. If we come to Christ, then we must abandon our sinful thoughts, as well as our sinful deeds, and embrace God's wisdom. The wonderful thing is in Isaiah, the second part of Isaiah 55.7, it says, if we are willing to come in repentance and faith and ab abandon our thoughts and give them over to him, to let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. What a glorious God we have. He's willing, he's able and ready to pardon even the vilest of sinners. But we've got to ab abandon our thoughts. And if you don't know Christ this morning, I would urge you to seek him. He will be found if you come to him in the right way. See, fallen man's thinking is so out of kilter with God that he needs to radically transform his thinking about everything when he or she comes to Christ. Well, that was our first point. But secondly, I believe it's very easy for believers to lapse into carnal thinking and be out of sync with God's thinking. Paul, in his earlier letter to Corinthians, addressed them in 1 Corinthians 3. And I want to read a few verses from that. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as the spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able. For you are still carnal. For where there is envy, strife, and division among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one, one, one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but the ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Mm 
Verse 18, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. For this is the wisdom, this world is, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness, and again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, but they are futile. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world of life or death. Or things present or things to come, all are yours. And you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. The significant thing is, Paul prays the Corinthians earlier in this uh, book, in 1 Corinthians 7, 1 and 7, that they came short in no spiritual gifts. But in this matter, we're behaving like infants. And it's not a question of spiritual age or how long one has been on the road as a believer. Sadly, there are Christians who have been on the road many years, but who are still babes in Christ. Jesus rebuked his disciples in Mark 10, because James and John sidled up to him and asked to sit at his right and left hand when he comes into glory. And when the other disciples heard it, they were furious with James and John. But they're all equally guilty of carnal thinking. And Jesus calls them over. He said, come over here, lads. He says, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them. And the great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so amongst you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever you desire, who you desire to be first shall be the slave of all. Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. James 4 addresses believers and says, Word of wars, and this is believers, bear in mind, word of wars and fights come from among you. Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Those are awfully strong words addressed to believers. And he goes on in verse 11, do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. And who are you to judge another? You know, we get very into very dangerous territory when we usurp God as a judge, as Christians, and start to judge our brethren. So my second point is, it's all too easy for Christians to lapse into carnal thinking. And we've got to guard against it. The old man wars against the new creation. And we constantly have to fight that battle to put him down. And our thoughts is an area of that battle. My third and final point is, what is the antidote to, fail, to falling into carnal thinking? Well, I think there are several antidotes. First and foremost, I think we need to have the right view of ourselves and our relationship to God. Paul talks in our text of bringing every thought into captivity. The Greek word is eik malotizo, I believe, if that's pronounced correctly. And it's drawn from military conquest where the victors led away the vanquished in chains and restricted their freedom. As believers, we're not free to do or think whatever we like. We are slaves of God. Now that's a hard concept for some people to swallow. But you think about it, we were once slaves of sin and the devil. But God has rescued us. Romans 6.22 says, but now, having been set free from sin, and having become slaves of God, slaves of God, 
You have fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. John MacArthur writes very well on this. I know some people don't like John MacArthur because he's strongly, rapidly anti-Pentecostal. And on that point, he is wrong. But in terms of the gospel and Jesus, he's absolutely bob on. And he writes, the fundamental aspects of slavery are the very features of our redemption that scripture puts the most stress on. We are chosen, Ephesians 1, 4 to 5, 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2, 9. We're bought, 1 Corinthians 6, 20 and 7, 23. We're owned by our master, Romans 14, 7 to 9 and 1 Corinthians 6, 19. And we're subject to the master's will and control over us and totally dependent on the master for everything in our lives. We're ultimately called to account, Romans 14, 12, evaluated, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, and either chastened or rewarded by him, Hebrews 12, 5 to 11. But he goes on to say that the Greek word for slave, doulos, has a companion word, a necessary companion word, with which doulos doesn't make any sense, without which doulos does not make sense. And the companion word is kurios. And curious means Lord. There's no such thing as a Lord or Master without a doulos. So this is a dominant paradigm in which we are to understand our relationship to Jesus Christ. He is Lord, and we are his slaves. But what a mighty Lord we serve. We once served Satan, we once served sin, and we were slaves to sin and bound by it. But he's released us. And we have a glorious master who loves us, who gave himself for us, and who has our very best intent at heart at all times. What a glorious Lord. But we are his slaves, make no doubt. But to consider ourselves dead to this world. Colossians 3, 1 to 15. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. For Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore put to death your members, which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked. When you lived in them but now you yourselves have put off have to put off all these anger wrath malice blasphemy filthy language out of your out of your mouth you don't lie to one another since you've put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him whether it's neither greek nor jew circumcision or uncircumcision barbarian Scythian, slave nor free but christ is all in all if we consider ourselves dead to this world and to sin, then we will be bringing our thoughts into captivity. You know, we're saved, the Bible tells us repeatedly, we're saved by grace alone. We have no cause to boast. The faith that we have to grasp Christ was a gift, his gift. The only thing we can boast, and I was pleased we sang those songs this morning, all my boast is in Jesus. The only thing we can boast in is Christ Jesus. But I also believe an antidote to wrong thinking is we need to have a right view of our relationship to fellow believers. And we need to take Christ as our supreme example. I'm going to read Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8. There's wonderful words. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant, a slave, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, 
in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and those under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. You know, when you think about that verse, Jesus gave up all the glory of heaven. You know, it's not as though a king on this earth gave up his throne and became a servant. That would be a big step. A mighty businessman, a Bill Gates of this world, gave it all up and went sweeping the road. It would be a big step. But Christ's step was infinitely greater than that. He gave up all the glory of heaven to come down to earth to be our saviour. Humility should be a key characteristic that we should strive for. Verse 3, a little earlier on, says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, listen to this, let each esteem others better than himself. And I ask myself that question, do I esteem others? My fellow believers, my brothers and sisters in Christ, do I consider them before myself greater than me? Put their needs before mine. The passage we read in Colossians 3 goes on from verse 12. Therefore is the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also you must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is a bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. You know, I'm amazed, and oftentimes in myself, how we get so riled when a Christian irks us. A little thing blown out of all magnitude. But you know, when we consider the great mountain of sin that God has forgiven us, that he's wiped clean, that he's thrown into the very depth of the ocean, that he's separated from as far as the east is from the west. What are we to hold those things against our, our fellow believers? You know, we need to have humility towards one another. We need to esteem each other better than ourselves. Jesus said, isn't it, the first and great commandment, to love your Lord, your God, with all your mind, body, soul, and spirit, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. That's a whole, whole order. But we can do it as Christ in everything. But another antidote is I think we need to have a right view towards God. And we need to remind ourselves, as I said at the beginning of this sermon, that God's thoughts and ways are infinitely higher than ours. He's God, He's the creator of all things, and we're the creatures. And we need to understand we will not always understand His ways. We'll have questions. And many of those will not be answered until we get to glory. Sometimes it'll shock and surprise us. The pastor's been preaching from Habakkuk in recent weeks. And Habakkuk was horrified that the Lord would use the Chaldeans to punish Judah. There were a race of people that were far more sinful, if you like, far more brutal than those they were punishing. Yet at the end of the book, Habakkuk, when all said and done, he says, when I heard my body trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will evade them with his troops. And he says in verse 17, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no fruit, food, Though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet and he will make me walk on my high hills. We may not understand, but we can rest that God is sovereign, that he always does right. Listen what the hymn writer says. And, um, 
Redemption Hymnal 495. God holds the key of all unknown, and I'm glad. If others should hold the key, or if you trusted it to me, I might be sad. I cannot read his future plans, but this I know. I have the smiling of his face and all the refuge of his grace. Well, here below. Enough. This covers me, covers all my wants, and so I rest. For what I cannot, he can see. And in his care, I saved should be forever blessed. So in conclusion, we've seen that conversion to Christ requires us to have a complete sea change in our thinking. An abandonment of our carnal thoughts alongside our sins. We've also seen that it's all too easy for Christians to lapse into carnal thinking. The antidote to which is to have a right view of ourselves, our relationship to God and fellow believers, to recognize we're slaves to Christ, and an acceptance that God's ways, thoughts as creator are infinitely greater than ours as creatures. You know, the wonderful thing coming back to our text when we strive to bring every thought into captivity to Christ is that our weapons are mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. If we really align our thoughts to God and his will, we'll be mighty. The Bible tells us that the people that do know their God should be strong and do exploits. I pray that individually and as a church here at Leyland, we would strive more to bring our thoughts into captivity to Christ. And I know he'll bless us as we seek to do so. I've chosen as a closing hymn, well, it's, it's a song really, it's not a hymn, uh, a very old one, Rain in Me. 